former Vice President Joe Biden will win Pennsylvania and Nevada, putting him over the 270 electoral votes he needs to become the 46th President of the United States. This is the time to heal in America. While I may be the first woman in this office, I will not be the last. President Trump remaining defiant and not conceding this race. By all indications today, the president wants to keep fighting all the way to the Supreme Court. Biden-Harris team unveiling its official transition website, buildbackbetter.com, outlining issues he says he'll tackle on day one. Good afternoon. Welcome back to Washington Post Live's Election Daily. I'm Bob Costa. President-elect Joe Biden is just that, the president-elect, yet President Trump has refused so far to concede to President-elect Biden, and he's mounting legal challenges in multiple states. And later this afternoon here at Post Live, I will be joined by Michigan's Governor Gretchen Whitmer, who played a critical part in helping Vice President Biden, now President-elect Biden, win that state last week in the presidential election. Hard Hard to believe it was only a week ago. It was the eve of the election. We'll also be joined by Ken Blackwell, a key ally of President Trump from Ohio, and Dan Balls, the chief correspondent of The Washington Post and probably the best scribe on American politics will be with us as well. But first, if you're joining us here on this live stream, there's some breaking news. If you haven't been scrolling Twitter for the last five minutes, President Trump just announced he has terminated the defense secretary, Mark Esper. And that is a major developing story. And so the three headlines I'm looking at right now are, of course, the Esper breaking news, the vaccine breakthrough with Pfizer. That changes everything for President-elect Biden as he sets up his task force today, looks ahead to 2021 as he deals with the coronavirus pandemic. To have a vaccine breakthrough, it, it really overhauls the entire transition the tone of the transition, the optimism that 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 infuses the entire discussion among his advisors. They're feeling good today in Biden world, but it's also a great moment for the country, hopefully, that this vaccine will be fully developed and distributed in the coming months and year. And that's part of the Biden lame duck story. Who's he going to pick for his cabinet? We may not see those images of the people coming to Wilmington, like we saw them coming to Bedminster for President Trump when he was president-elect or Trump Tower. But he has some decisions to make. Does he go left wing? Does he go centrist? Uh, I'm hearing Lael Branyard for Treasury, uh, even though liberals want to see Senator Warren become the Treasury Secretary. And the other big story is Trump rallies. Will the president hold rallies or not? That's a tension point based on my reporting. I have a front page story today with Josh Dossie and Phil Rucker about the president thinking about it. But so far, nothing scheduled. Axios just reported that the president's already talking about 2024. I've heard the similar, but it's so much about keeping his name in the conversation. And that really is the future of Trumpism is going to be tested in the coming weeks. But let's bring in Dan Balls, the chief correspondent of The Washington Post. Dan, you just you've heard the breaking news about Secretary Esper. Not unusual in a lame duck for a president to get rid of some cabinet personnel. But what makes this different, if at all? Well, I think that there has always been a concern, uh, frankly, among Trump allies as well as adversaries, uh, that he will use the transition period um, to, you know, to kind of run rampant through the executive branch. We know he's got a lot of grievances about different people in the executive branch. Um, And so to fire the Secretary of Defense at this point um, is just an indication of kind of where his his head is right now and what he may be thinking about what he wants to do during the duration of the of the transition. I mean, he's got 70 or so days uh, in which he remains the president of the United States and therefore has the, the levers of power at his disposal. Uh, and so to do this as quickly as he has done it, I think will send a shock through the executive branch and, and probably beyond that into uh, Republican allies in Congress with the question of what else will he be doing during this period? Dan, are there any legal challenges out there that catch your eye that are more than just partisan noise or speculation? Is there anything that could be a development to President Trump's point that the election, in his view, isn't over? Bob, I don't think we've seen anything so far that suggests that there is there is grounds for a legal challenge that would in any way change the outcome of the election. 
Um, might there be some ballot irregularities? Certainly, that's often the case in elections. Um, might the counts change when the, we go into recounts? Yes, that often happens as well. Uh, but generally, given the margins that we are seeing in these states, in Pennsylvania, in Wisconsin, even in Georgia uh, and Arizona, um, those those hold pretty well for Biden at this point, absent something more credible than the Trump operation has been able to bring forward so far. Most of mostly, it has been allegations uh, as opposed to evidence, and there's a big difference. As somebody said over the weekend, you can say anything you want in a press conference, uh, but it's a lot different when you go into court and try to make that stick. Speaking of what, what you can say in a press conference, a lot of top Democrats in news conferences over the weekend on the Sunday shows have expressed optimism about the, the, run, the runoffs in Georgia for U.S. Senate. But is it going to be possible for the Democrats to take those seats in Georgia to get the kind of turnout they need? They had big turnout during a presidential election. Uh, but now it, it's different, as you know, in a runoff. What's your view of how that's going to play out? Bob, I think it's going to be a real struggle. I, I would think at this point it will be difficult for the Democrats to get uh, both of those seats. Um, you know, one maybe, but both is, is going to be difficult. On the other hand, one of the things we know is that Democrats are going to nationalize this, um, not just in the amount of money that's coming in, but to do everything they can to make this a, a part of uh, a Biden administration and a Biden presidency. Um, and we have watched in Georgia over the last two years, since Stacey Abrams ran and came very close to winning the governorship in 2018, uh, the work that has been done at the ground level in Georgia uh, to get ready for this election, to get people registered and then to get them out to vote. Um, and I think that we will see an enormous effort on the part of the Democrats to do that. Um, and the question is, will the same incentive be there for the Republicans? Um, if, if the Republicans are um, kind of fighting among themselves about whether the president did or didn't concede or should have conceded earlier if he eventually does so, uh, if the party is in that kind of sort of situation, it might be more difficult for them to get out all of their vote. But um, I think that given where we are right now, you would have to say the Democrats uh, have a little higher hill to climb than Republicans. Dan, final question here. Vice President Biden became president-elect Biden formally on Saturday when the race was called. He gave a big speech on Saturday night. We all watched it. Haven't got a chance to catch up with you since then, Dan. What have you made about how Biden met the moment and also how he's handled this transition period on Monday by announcing his, his plans for executive orders and convening this coronavirus task force? Bob, I thought it was a very good speech on the part of President-elect Biden. Um, he is not always the most eloquent uh, orator, um, but I thought that he rose to this moment. I thought that the tone of it was was uh, what he wanted. Uh, I thought that all of the talk that he um, said about healing the country was appropriate and, and necessary, given that there are 70 million people who voted for Donald Trump and not for Joe Biden. Um, and I think that the way he is so far rolling out the transition also gives an indication of kind of um, the priorities that he has. And that first priority is dealing with the coronavirus pandemic, which is still the biggest problem he has to overcome. Obviously, the news on the vaccination front today is welcome news and great news for everybody. But I think that everybody knows that it will be many, many months uh, before most people are uh, will have access to that vaccination. And in the interim, we're still in a period when these cases are rising at a very rapid rate. So um, he's moving deliberately um, and I think focusing on the right things so far. Dan, great to have you here. And it was great to work with you on that oral history. If you guys are watching this, if you haven't had a chance to pick up the print edition, it's special section today. And it, I have to say, Dan, I know we're tooting our own horn here, but that story it's pretty special to capture the mood in the country. I'll, I'll let you go, Dan, and let you get back to work, but appreciate not only you coming on today, but working with me and our colleagues on that story. Dan Balls, thank you. Bob, thank you. It's an oral history in today's Washington Post. But let's talk now to Ken Blackwell, who I've known for a long time, have covered the former Secretary of State of Ohio. He's a, an ally of President Trump, who's been helping the president's campaign. Secretary Blackwell, great to have you here. Good to be with you, Rob. Why hasn't the president conceded yet? And how do you see this week playing out? Well, let's, let's start with a couple of realities. 
one, not one state, and you would, from a journalistic point of view, confirm this, not one state has certified their state elections. Am I not right? Correct. The process takes much longer right. to certify. It's not, not oh, absolutely it's not certified. There are a number formal of certification. These, You're exactly right. These, these are a number. A number of states are with within what I call the margin of litigation, uh, legally and by the rules. Uh, there, there will be recounts. Would you agree with that? You're looking at a recount possibly in Georgia. Which other states are you looking at? I. It, it, Nevada, it, it's it's within the recount. Uh, Arizona, and so there are a number of states that are within that margin that allows for a recount. There are enough irregularities, and cases will be prosecuted. But let's stick on Pennsylvania, for instance. One of the things that I find absolutely amazing is that the mainstream media has made projections prophecy as if they have been, you know, had their ears whispered to by a divine force. Projections are not the final results. And we have too much experience in electoral history in this country where projections have been wrong. And so I've counseled uh, the president's team, one, to be thorough and to be patient and to play by this rule book, the Constitution of the United States. In Pennsylvania, there is a legitimate and serious constitutional issue. And that is who has the authority by the Constitution to establish the ground rules for an election? It is the state legislature, not the state Supreme Court. There is a serious issue uh, and if you begin to look at the number of votes that came in after, at the close of election day at eight o'clock, that is a substantial number of ballots. And the question will be, how do you remedy that? Because I think the Supreme Court- Well, in will, Pennsylvania, uh, Secretary Blackwell, not to interrupt, but we're it, in Pennsylvania, the it, Supreme Court Justice Samuel Alito ruled that those ballots were segregated, but he, he enabled on Friday night for the co count to continue in Pennsylvania. And mail-in ballots were part of the process legally in Pennsylvania, and it was the state's decision to have them counted in the way they've been counted. No, it was the Supreme Court's decision that extended the election date from the close of the election, or the close of business election day to three days later. Is that not right? It was the Supreme Court. It was Court a 4 4 order. decision. It was a 4 4 it, it, decision. It no, it was a state Supreme Court order. A state right. Supreme Court order. It that was, was in not challenge. the action of the legislature. So if we're going to play by the rule book, let's be thorough and let's play, play according to the rules. So I actually think. I, but, I, I, I actually but Secretary think, Blackwell, you, would you acknowledge, me, though, oh, that oh, yeah, 2016. I think, I, think Pennsylvania, I think Pennsylvania is in play. I actually think. Arizona is still in question mark, and Nevada. So these projections, and where no state has certified a final tally, how can you be? How can you begin to call somebody president elect when when his opponent has not conceded? And 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 I go back, but Secretary to Blackwell, in 2016, I go back, president. I, go back to 2000, I know, but you, Gore, Gore had, I understand Gore your point had, about certification. Gore had the the, the, the decency to pull back, you know, uh, declaring that he had won until the process played out. And that's all I'm suggesting is that there's a lot of premature assumptions and actions going on and the final tally is not in, the litigation is not over, the thoroughness has yet to begin in terms of some very questionable irregularities in three to five states. That's all. Uh, patience, thoroughness, and play by the rule book. And, 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 and at the end of the day, if the count goes in, in Biden's favor, I am sure the president will do the right thing. But he's not going to prematurely throw in the towel because the uh, mainstream media has 
projected. Projections well, are not. Secretary Blackwell, if, if you wouldn't mind me, if I could just interject for a moment. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The, the mainstream media, as you, Secretary Blackwell, just for a moment. Mm -hmm. In 2016, the presidential race, the race was called by media organizations who are looking at the math and Secretary Clinton accepted those calls. And so did President Trump. President Trump did not say as president-elect in 2016, I want to wait until to be called president-elect until everything's certified by the U.S. Congress and the Electoral College. So the, the, the suggestion that uh, people consent. always wait is not consent. entirely accurate. She had, no, it is, it, it is accurate. He, in fact, had her concession. And there were not, the, the, the states did not play out in terms of her co commanding or demanding recount. So look, I have a long history of electoral politics in the United States. And I would suggest to you that let's, let's, let's just be clear. Hillary Clinton basically this time told Joe Biden not to accept the results of this election until he won. Now, that's been quoted. You all have carried it. Now, people might try to conveniently forget it, but don't think the president is going to throw in the towel based on the media projections when, in fact, there are a lot of questions that have not been answered. And, uh, and I think a substantial case, particularly in Pennsylvania to be prosecuted. Secretary Blackwell, when you look at the Electoral College and the, the, the suggestion among some Republicans to disrupt the count in the Electoral College, the, the concept of faithless electors, is there discussion in Trump circles and GOP circles about having an effort on that front? Uh, no, well, who's talking about faith, faithless electors? Basically what the president wants, he wants and when he wins a state, he wants his elector to be faithful. His electors to be faithful. Now, let's go back to Pennsylvania, because it will really be interesting. If the Supreme Court says that there was a constitutional violation and the override of the state Supreme Court of the state legislatures schedule and the state legislature says our schedule is the rule and Trump wins, there, there, there are a couple of remedies. One, a do-over, and that's a pretty tight schedule. Two, the Supreme of uh, the, the, the state legislature can declare the legal winner. Period. Those are those are in the rule book. So let's not. What is your games. concern, though, with these ballots were mailed in nobody, nobody under the law? Faithless. Nobody has to be faithless, faithless, faithless. Let's be true to the rule book, the Constitution. But speaking about the rule book, what is to make the law? What, what is your concern with ballots that have been legally mailed in during a global pandemic? If, in fact, they were they, got, they arrived at the prescribed time in the prescribed time frame of the state legislature, something that had been carefully crafted and then was overridden by the state Supreme Court unconstitutionally, the in fact state legislature can say those ballots that came in under our prescribed rules when the call today those and and, and 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 you can't tell me right now so you would be comfortable by discounting thousands and thousands of ballots that were mailed under the presumption they were being done legally because of the, the way the court had handled it uh, under the rule book right under the rule book what, what would you say to those thousands of pennsylvanians who feel like they did everything right and the state legislature might say hey as tight as the schedule is, we'll do a do-over. And those folks who can legally cast a ballot will legally cast a ballot. It won't be the first time that 
an elected body, uh, uh, electors have had to do a do-over. What's, what's the other example of that? What's the other example about what? You the just other, said this the, not the first the, time. Uh, what's the, the other time? The other, the, other, the, the other example would be the state legislature says, these were the rules, and in fact, we're going to declare the winner. It's, it's constitutional according to the rule book, but it is why, it is why I, 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 for the life of me, can't see why the mainstream media is declaring that they have the right and the authority to certify an election and declare a winner, particularly when one of the contestants is not conceding and you know that the results in these states are within the margin of litigation uh, and, and, and uh, recount. So that's all I'm asking is that we all be a little patient, we all be fair, we all be consistent. And What's your I, reaction? I, think I think it's wonderful that, that we in fact now are, because of warp speed, Operation Warp Speed, we in fact have a vaccine at our doorstep. And if in fact people start to give Joe Biden credit for that and overlook the operation that the President of the United States, Donald J. Trump, put in the motion to produce an extraordinary turnaround of a major vaccine, I think that's a bit dishonest. And, and I think that folks well, who do that, Secretary I think folks who do that, you know, are trying to, in fact, shape a narrative that's unfortunate. No, it's, it's not about shaping a narrative. Number one, President Trump did start Operation Vaccine, encouraging a swift vaccine development. That's a fact. That's true what you said. At the same time, Pfizer has independently developed its vaccine. It is also working closely with the administration on the distribution process, but the development Pfizer stated clearly today was on its own. But you're right. Great news for the country if this vaccine comes through. Uh, Secretary Blackwell, there is talk of a possible run in 2024 by President Trump should he be defeated this time around. The Washington Post is at this position, not in the same position you are. Based on the results, based on math, it is President-elect Biden. Uh, I know you do not share that view. But let's say President Trump is formally certified as the loser of this election. Do you believe he will run again in 2024? Uh, look, I'm not, not going to walk through that crack in the open door. Uh, look, this has not been decided yet. Uh, and any speculation uh, about 2024 is almost mind numbing. Fair enough. Uh, Secretary Blackwell, where are you traveling next as part of this process for the as the Trump world continues to try to fight these battles? Well, you know, I, I will probably stay focused on Pennsylvania. You know, there, 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 there's a team in, in uh, Georgia. There's a team in um, Nevada and, and also a team in Arizona. And I would imagine there are their teams elsewhere. Both sides have batteries of very competent lawyers. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm focusing on Pennsylvania because I actually think that there were a, a, enough irregularities coupled with unconstitutional overreach uh, by the state Supreme Court uh, and the governor uh, to, uh, to, to force a, uh, a, a real showdown in Pennsylvania. So I'm, I'm staying focused there. Do you believe President Trump, or do you know if he will hold rallies, campaign-style rallies, in the coming weeks? I don't know. I, I really, I, I've tried to stay focused. Uh, there are do you think you should? The, there are folks in the political operation. I, you know, look, you know this. You and I have talked about it in 2016. President Trump has been a very successful uh, entrepreneur. Who, who, whose economic and financial success came through his running of a, a, a family control LLC, Limited Liability Corporation. Uh, he hasn't had to deal with uh, boards of directors. He hasn't had to deal with shareholders. He, in fact, has a very tight circle and he drives the decision. Uh, I, wouldn't, I would not dare tell President Trump 
if he should or shouldn't engage in this process. Uh, he, he has done something that uh, I don't know any other American has ever done. His first office, political office, elective office, was president of the United States. He accelerated economic growth and job creation in this country before the pandemic uh, at, to historic levels. Put money in, in, the, in the wallets and pocketbooks of families, lifted the incomes of workers, uh, and uh, actually repositioned us as the most energy independent country in the world. And he also positioned us uh, in, in a position where we could, without backing up to the, to the, to the window, claim that America in its 244 years of existence is the most robust economically, most diverse population-wise, constitutional republic in all of human history. Secretary Blackwell, appreciate you stopping by this afternoon. I do remember that conversation in 2016. All eyes were on Ohio then, Remain, <laughs> remains a key state in the presidential uh, cycle, every presidential cycle. Appreciate you coming That's by. Good. Thank you. Always good to be with you. Thanks for the spirit. Thank you, sir. Now we'll be joined by Michigan's governor, Gretchen Whitmer, a return guest to Washington Post Live. She is co-chair of the Biden campaign. Her state, it went for President Trump in 2016, but it was all in for President-elect Biden this time around. And she is working closely with Vice President Biden. Now, President-elect Biden, still getting used to it uh, on the coronavirus pandemic. She's been on the forefront of that uh, difficult issue. Governor Whitmer, welcome back. Thank you. Good to be with you. Governor, is it time for President Trump to concede? I think so. I do. You know, I think one of the tenets of the American democracy that makes us the greatest democracy in the world is that we have a peaceful transition of power, that we abide by the will of the people. And this election, the people have spoken. They spoke overwhelmingly. We saw such an increase in voter engagement across the country and certainly here in Michigan. This is a moment where we as Americans need to come together. And it is not easy. I think that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris gave a couple of wonderful speeches on Saturday night, uh, reaching out to people whose candidate perhaps was not them and saying, you have a place here. We will be an administration for everyone, every American. And it was a moment that I think was really important. And I would love to see people of goodwill on both sides of the aisle say our democracy, our republic is a heck of a lot more important than a political party or a political figure. Now is the time for us to move forward as a country and to recognize the validity um, of, of this election and move forward. What does it mean for American democracy if President Trump does not concede? Well, I think that it is a sad commentary that, um, you know, the personal needs of one would uh, be more important than, than the sanctity and confidence in our system of democracy and the election that just happened last Tuesday. But we will move forward. It will not change the outcome. It will not change the fact that Joe Biden is the president-elect. It will not change that on January 20th, he will take his oath of office as the 46th president of the United States of America, and he will continue to move on an agenda that uh, really is focused on getting our arms around COVID-19, getting our Americans back to work and keeping American kids in our, in our schools and making sure they have what they need to be successful learners. All of these are the fundamentals that he ran on. It is what I believe will guide his agenda. And what I know about Joe Biden, and I think what so many do know about this, this man is he's a loyal man. He is a man who keeps his word. He is someone who is always going to be focused on building bridges as opposed to walls. And I, I know that he will be able to, to work with everyone who wants to get those important things done for the people of this country. What's your reaction, Governor Whitmer, to the news this afternoon, just minutes ago? that President Trump has, quote, terminated his word, Secretary Mark Esper at the Pentagon. Well, I, I, I don't know that I've got a lot of thoughtful reaction to it. I've got a lot of questions, as I'm sure you do as well. Um, certainly, uh, the, the 
rhetoric that comes out of the White House and the reality often are not uh, connected. And I guess I want to understand a little bit more about what has what has happened and why. Do you believe there will be a peaceful transition of power? There will be a peaceful transition of power. The only I think the big question is, will the Trump administration work toward that end? Um, I know that Biden-Harris administration is already at work ensuring that uh, as, as they prepare to take their oaths of office, they are ready to move on day one, whether it is through executive orders, it is outreach that needs to happen, or is the task force around COVID. They are already at work, and there's an incredible amount that will happen between now and January 20th. It would be a, a wonderful thing if the outgoing administration would work with them to uh, make sure that we're able to live up to the expectations of, of the founders of our nation and the, all of the people that call this great nation home. The outgoing administration is one factor, certainly, for the transition and the president-elect. So are other leaders in the country. Will they work with the president-elect to help tackle the coronavirus pandemic? Governor Whitmer, are you willing to serve in the Biden cabinet? You know, I believe that as governor of Michigan, I will play an important role as an ally of a Biden-Harris administration, as uh, someone who has been on the ground and front and center combating COVID-19 at the state level. I am grateful for the relationship that I have with Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. I know that it'll nurture to our mutual benefit as we continue to move forward, but my intention is to stay right here at home in Michigan um, and, and continue that relationship with them so I can get more done for the people of my state. Senator Gary Peters narrowly won his reelection race. It was a point of anxiety for Democrats, however, in closing days uh, of the campaign. What happened in that race against Republican John James? Yes, Senator Peters pulled it out, but do Democrats have work to do in your state ahead of 2022? I think Democrats always have work to do. I think we all have um, a, a, an important charge to seek to understand where people are, what they're worried about, how we can solve problems and how we can meet people's needs. Gary Peters is a wonderful United States Senator. He works hard. He is passionate about our water and water defines us here in Michigan. We are home to 21% of the world's fresh water. Gary has been uh, one of the people in the United States Senate that held the U.S. Postal Service to account when questions about undermining this election uh, became apparent. So he's been a great leader on behalf of Michigan. I think these races are always close in Michigan. We will always see that. And that's why throughout this election, I've maintained the road to the White House goes through the state of Michigan. And uh, focusing on what Michigan voters care about, seeking to understand voters who didn't vote or voted the other way is always important. We need leaders who can solve problems. And to do that, you got to know what, what the people of your state are concerned about. And that's an ongoing challenge and need that I will continue to live up to as governor. And I know Gary Peters, Debbie Stabenow, all of our phenomenal leaders here in Michigan are committed to that too. You just said that the race for president goes through Michigan. I took a look at your Twitter account earlier today, and you also have said that it not only goes through Michigan, but it means earning the trust of people in the city of Detroit. What did you mean by that? I think it's really important to acknowledge that this coalition that elected uh, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris was a diverse coalition. When Joe Biden gave his speech on Saturday night, he specifically acknowledged African-American voters uh, who were a big part of the coalition that, that helped um, elect Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. Kamala Harris recognized women voters. Uh, women voters of all different races and ethnicities were an important part of this coalition as well. And I recognize and wanted to highlight that the city of Detroit is um, is a meaningful, important constituency when you're talking about the state of Michigan, and I don't want that ever to get lost on anyone. Here on the East Coast, Representative Abigail Spamberger, who's a House member from Virginia, a moderate Democrat, she recently has criticized Democrats on a conference call. You may have heard about it for using phrases, some of them at least, like defund the police or embracing the idea of democratic socialism. Did she have a point or not? 
I think to the extent that the point is words matter, I'm always going to agree with that sentiment. In fact, that was a phrase that I used in my response to uh, the president's State of the Union back in February, which seems like a lifetime ago. But that was a phrase that I use, words matter. And when we're talking about the righteous conversation around policing and race and equity in this country, um, it is a righteous conversation. And these are peaceful, righteous demonstrations that are happening. They're also, I think, important to moment to acknowledge that uh, under investment in the things that really create opportunity in level playing fields is crucial. It's um, important that we talk about that. And we identify that as the source of where we can find um, opportunity and really address some of the things that contribute to the experience that African-Americans are dealing with in this country. And I, I think that's really an important part of the conversation and agenda that has to center the work we do moving forward. You've really been pushing in Michigan for people to wear face coverings, to wear masks. And you probably saw the news governor that Utah's Republican governor, Gary Herbert, has now issued a mask mandate in his state. What's your advice to the governor as he goes about that? And some people in Utah, just like in Michigan, as you know well, may not love the idea of a mandate. But also, is a mandate enough? I've read that you've recently been pushing to put it into law, the mandate, rather than, the, than just having an executive order. Why do you think it's necessary to go that far? Well, what I think we really need to do as a nation is get the politics out of this public health conversation. It has undermined our ability to focus on our health, and that is the health of everyone, not Democrats, not Republicans, public health. This is a crisis that we are confronting, and COVID-19 does not care about your politics. COVID-19 is a very real threat to every single one of us all across this country. Uh, governor Herbert has got a challenge in front of him, just like every one of us governors does. The reason I've been asking my legislature to codify this is because I have a Republican legislature and it really needs to be all hands on deck in order to push our COVID numbers down. And codification would say, we Republican legislature, agree, we've got to get the politics out, we've all got to mask up. That's the value in that. Currently, the law in Michigan is you're supposed to be wearing a mask. Um, that is the law. It, codification won't change that, but it will uh, reinvigorate, I think, the bipartisan effort that needs to happen in this country around masking up because this is a dangerous moment. We as a nation are posting record numbers every day the numbers are getting worse. Uh, that means more hospitalizations. That means, sadly, more deaths. And it is going to keep getting worse as the temperature plummets and we converge with flu season. And so masking up right now is and remains, despite the great news on the vaccine front, currently the best tool we still have is a mask. And we've got to get the politics out of putting that mask on because it's a way to be patriotic. It's a way to protect ourselves. It's a way to protect our economy. Your state is going to get very chilly in the coming weeks as winter nears. How are you going to respond to Michiganders who say, Governor, I'm sick of this. Governor, you're acting like big brother with these mandates. I'm not going to follow this. And they, they're not maybe convinced by the argument you just made that there are facts are there, there are there are outbreaks throughout the state, outbreaks throughout the nation. How are you going to handle that type of person in Michigan? who's just sick of the pandemic and thinks you're overstepping your executive power? Well, I think a new administration will go a long way toward that. If we can have people who have positions of authority all continuing to share accurate, consistent medical information about the seriousness of this virus. If we can build coalitions, Republican and Democratic alike. I've got an ongoing conversation with my colleagues here in the region governors on both sides of the aisle who are confronting the very same thing and are trying to achieve the same goals, and that is increasing compliance with masks. We all know this is the best thing that we can do, but we're all tired of it. Trust me, I'm as tired of COVID-19 as the average person in Michigan or the average person in any part of this country is, and yet COVID-19 doesn't care. And that's why it's so important that we continue to try to find ways to break through and to explain to people 
what's really at stake here and, and why it's so important every one of us does our part. Our rural hospitals are filling up. Uh, what was largely considered an urban issue, right? Places where big cities are, are where people are um, seeing where COVID was spreading so fast early on. It's now a much more ur or rural issue. And our rural hospitals are nowhere near as big or as equipped to deal with the COVID influx. And that means more people are gonna get hurt in our rural areas. So we really have to um, do everything we can to build the coalition, to reach out to people, to earn their uh, support and enthusiasm for a mask mandate. And it's not gonna be easy. The, to some extent, the politics that have been played out for the last eight months will make that a lot harder. And yet we can't give up. And so we're gonna press forward and, and do everything we can to save lives. Final question, Governor Whitmer. You have been in the news for an, un an uneasy reason, uh, the kidnapping plot against you. As you look ahead to 2021 in a Biden administration, there will be a new attorney general uh, here in Washington. Would you like to see the administration, and, and in particular DOJ, be more aggressive in investigating militia groups, white supremacist groups? Does something more need to be done? Well, I think one of the things that needs to be done is using accurate language as we talk about groups that are threatening the safety of their fellow Americans. Those are domestic terror organizations and none of us should tolerate it. When the plot was revealed, um, I gave a speech shortly thereafter and I quoted Ronald Reagan. I did that because I wanted people to understand people of goodwill on both sides of the aisle need to recognize and, and stand up and call out domestic terrorism and say it's unacceptable. A Department of Justice, whether it's in a Biden administration or a Republican administration, it shouldn't matter if there is a group that is organizing to terrorize or hurt their fellow Americans, they need to be um, held accountable. And that's, that's all I think we should we should all be able to expect that from our Department of Justice, no matter who's in the White House. Governor Whitmer, thanks so much for joining us again here at Washington Post Live. Hope you come back soon. Thank you. And thank you all for joining us for these conversations today. Dan Balls, Secretary Blackwell, staunch president, supporter of President Trump, Governor Whitmer on the front lines of the pandemic, also close to the president-elect, Joe Biden. Hope you enjoyed it as much as I did to your in-depth uh, views from some of the key people and reporters uh, on the big stories. Washington Post Live will be back tomorrow on Tuesday at 11.30 a.m. Eastern Time. My colleague David Ignatius from the editorial page, one of the world's best columnists. He will talk about the latest vaccine developments with Santa Fe CEO Paul Hudson. And be sure to join me tomorrow at 1 o'clock Eastern for another edition of Post-Election Daily here at Washington Post Live. I'm Bob Costa. Thanks again for joining us, and we'll see you tomorrow.